first question is evaluating the function we have to however do a function composition that means we're going to take the innermost function the g of x which is 3x minus 4 and we're going to plug it inside of the f of x so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take the f of x and now it's f of g of x i'm going to take that g of x function there and i'm going to plug it in where the x was in my f of x function so that's going to be 3x minus 4 and then i still have my plus 2. so this was x plus 2 and now i've replaced the x with this whole thing right here i'm going to go ahead and simplify that and when i do that i go ahead and get 3x minus 2 which looks like a let's look at the next one this is another competition composition and it has g of x on the inside so my g of x means i'm going to take that g of x right there and i'm going to substitute that in for the x in the other one now what makes this one a little bit more complicated is that we have an x squared so when i go ahead and substitute g of x in i end up with this I just am writing the g of x term. So all of that used to be just x. But now it's x squared, so I have to make sure I square that whole thing. I still have a plus 2 on the outside. So hopefully what we can see when we look at this is that this is the same as this right here, except that I've replaced the x with negative x plus 2. Now this is where we have to do our foiling. We have to split this up. So I'm going to rewrite this twice. So this is kind of my scratch work here a little bit. And I need to multiply this out on both of them. So I'm going to multiply the negative x times negative x and I get positive x squared. The negative x times 2 and I get negative 2x. Now I'm going to multiply the second term, plus 2 minus x, that's multiplication, remember, so it's going to be negative 2x, positive 2 times positive 2 is going to be positive 4. So all of that, all of that right there, is just that first part, so I still have the plus 2 at the end I need to add. I'm going to add plus 2 at the end. Now, if I go ahead and simplify that and combine my like terms, I do end up with a plus 6. The only one of those that has a plus 6 is B, and my right answer is B. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. When I did this problem first in my head, I didn't do it this long way. and I didn't do all of the math. I did the math quickly. In other words, I did the 2 squared and got 4, and then I added the 2. And so I could immediately tell without having to do all this extra math, that the answer was B because it was multiple choice. So the only one that made sense for me was B. But if you can't see that quite off the top of your head, then you just have to multiply it out. You have to foil out those binomials. Number three, again, we have a composition. I think when you guys took this, you took it on the computer, so it was scrambled. But here they're going to be in order, which makes it a little bit easier as we're going through it. So we have the g of x term, which is 2x plus 1. And again, that's plugging inside of the h of x. So I'm going to take the formula, which was h of x, and I'm just going to swap it out, swap out the x for the g of x term. So where there was an x, now there's going to be a 2x plus 1. So 2x plus 1, and then I still have minus 4. And that simplifies out to be 2x minus 3. So those, those are the composition functions that we saw on this last test, just three of them, I think. And as we keep going, now we start talking about functions and the domain and range of functions. First up, we have what is the range of this function? First off, we could graph that and find it. But this is a linear function. 
and it's not a constant function. In other words, it's not like y equals 5. If y equals 5, then the answer would be 5. There's no reason to believe that this has a maximum or minimum because a linear function is essentially going to be a line that has arrows on each end, and therefore my answer is C. For more or less the same reason, number 5, I could graph it and look where are my x's, but this is again a linear function. And one thing I know about lines, when I have a linear function, they have errors on both ends, which means, again, I'm not limited, so my domain is all real numbers. So there's a shortcut, a little key for you. Linear functions are going to be all real numbers, domain and range. You don't even need to do any graphing or find the slope or y-intercept. They just are always going to be all real numbers. Number six, this time it's not linear. So we actually have to look at this sucker. We have the graph, and it says, what is the range? Well, hopefully we can tell by this point that we have a minimum right there. Everything about this graph happens above that line. When we look for a range, the range is talking about the y values. So if we look on the y-axis, what is the minimum on the y-axis? If I go down, you can see I drew my green barrier line here. My minimum is at 3, actually negative 3, right? So my range is from negative 3, and it goes up from there. So let's look at our answer choices. Is it all real numbers? No. Is it not equal to 3.5 and not equal to 1.5? No, I think they're trying to get us to fall for that those would be the zeros. That's not what we're looking for here. Is it less than negative 3 or is it greater than negative 3? And so greater than negative 3 is going to be our answer there. Number 7, which function decreases... De decreases through the interval from 2 to infinity. That is an, an inequality notation, which is fine, but we have our interval from 2 to infinity. Which one is decreasing? This one from 2 to infinity is increasing. B from 2 to infinity is increasing. C from 2 to infinity is flat. And D from 2... so. I'm, on down, that's the one. So we have our answer. Our answer is going to be D. That's the only one that's decreasing. Notice I started at the X of 2. I didn't look for a Y of 2. I looked at for an X of 2. So I started where X was 2, and I moved towards infinity. But hopefully that was obvious because the question right up here had the X in the middle. So it's telling us, hey, look for the X's when we're talking about where to look. Next, we have... Again, an interval that is decreasing. Again, we have x's on all these. We're going to have to graph this, okay? But roughly, what we end up having for this shape is one of these. One of these shapes, okay? You can take my word for it, but you probably shouldn't. You should probably open desmos.com, graphing calculator, and type that in. Or... You could open your TI-83, TI-84, if you have a Casio, graph that. And if you graph that, you're going to get kind of this S shape. And it has a decreasing part in the middle. So, if we were to graph that and look at our graph, is it decreasing from negative infinity to zero? Nope. Is it going decreasing from 3.3 .3 to infinity? No, it's actually decreasing in the middle. So now it's just a matter of looking at our graph and deciding where exactly are those maximum and minimums? Where's those peaks and valleys? And if you graph it, you will see that it's actually between x equals 0 and x equals 3.3. .3. The next one, again, we have an x cubed function so we again have a cubic so we're going to have kind of an s shape and again it's asking for decreasing man i was very repetitive on these if you were good at this then you got these two questions right again we're going to have the kind of s shape again it means somewhere in the middle we're going to actually have to graph this one because all of these are kind of in the middle i will say that it's definitely not the second one because we're still looking for just like last time that middle section where it's decreasing. We think about decreasing not from going downhill. 
simply because if you look this way, you could go, oh, it's going downhill. Or if you're going from the left to right, uh, right to left, it could be going downhill. When we talk about decreasing, we actually want to make sure we're talking about going from left to right. What is happening? You always got to go left to right, just like Mario in Super Mario Brothers or actually most side-scrolling games go left to right. So I think about it like video games. You might think about it if you're a book person, you read words on a page from left to right. Okay. So let's go ahead and graph it. I'm going to open my graphing calculator. I'm actually going to use my TIE3, so um, let me type it in. All right. So I have my graphing calculator here, and I don't know what I was working on before, but I'm going to go ahead and type in my function. And our function was x cubed minus 4x. So I'm going to jump over and do x cubed, and get out of there, minus 4x. And if I graph that, let's see what, what it looks like. Yep, sure enough, it's got that S shape, and it's going upward. And if I look in the middle of that, I'm actually going to just trace it, because I think we can just kind of trace it to get our points here. If I press trace, right in the middle at 0, 0, right in the middle there. But where's kind of this peak? What is the X value here? It looks like about negative 1, uh, maybe a little bit more than negative 1. It's hard to tell exactly when I'm just using trace. And then if I go over to the right, Where's that valley? And it's about positive one, it looks like. So now I'm going to go back to my test, and I'm going to look for answer choices in that range. And I said about negative one, maybe a little bit more than that. And so look, we got negative 1.2 and positive 1.2. If you're using Desmos.com, that graphing calculator will go ahead and give you a point on the maximum and minimum. And so we were... Uh, we were encouraged to use Desmos on this test because I really wanted you to see that there are some advantages to that over having to calculate <clears throat> calculate your maximum or minimum uh, that we'd have to do on a TA-84. So our correct answer in this one is going to be D. Next up, we have this very ugly function. Ah, I guess it's not that ugly. It looks kind of exciting. Uh, I say exciting because I have no idea what the equation would be. Luckily, I don't have to come up with an equation. I just need to pick all of the statements that are true. So we just have no other way to do this. We're going to just go through one by one. First, the absolute maximum of f is 1. Okay, so where is the absolute maximum of this function? It looks like it would be right up top, right here. While we're at it, we might as well jot the absolute minimum. And it looks like... Right there. Now, before I lead you astray here, I do want to remind you that I just said it looks like that. That doesn't mean that is the minimum. It's trying to mislead you here. That is not the absolute minimum. Why isn't it the absolute minimum? You probably can tell. Because we have these arrows right here. This is going down. So what does that tell us? It tells us there's, there is no absolute minimum. All right, so I can tell right off the bat, no absolute minimum. I'm going to jump over to the absolute minimum because we just made that point and cross out. There is an absolute minimum. Nope, that's not true. Uh, the absolute maximum is 1. Well, that's certainly not true. It looks like it might be 7, so it's not, not that one. The relative maximum or a relative maximum is 1. Well, I know the absolute maximum isn't 1, but did you notice this other maximum right here? There is an a maximum at 1. It's actually at negative 4 on the x, and the 1 would be the maximum value, so that's a y value. And so that is actually true. The absolute maximum is 7. I agree. A relative minimum is at negative 3. And if we look at this graph, we just mentioned that there is no absolute minimum, but there is a relative minimum at negative 3. You can see the bottom of this one right here. 
a relative minimum is negative 2. Um, that's the only minimum I see. So I'm going to say no to any other relative minimums. Now we have to make a decision on the last two. A relative maximum is 7 and a relative maximum is 8. I know it's not 8 because we already said our absolute maximum is 7. How do you feel about the relative maximum being 7? We already picked an absolute maximum of 7, which means there's also a relative maximum. If somebody were to ask you, what's the tallest mountain uh, in, in Virginia? You might be right if you pick sharp top. But if somebody also asks you what's the somebody else asks you and they go what is the tallest mountain in Bedford? You might also say sharp top. By the way, both of those are wrong, but that's for another story. Number 11. What is the minimum value of that function? Now, it gives us a function to graph. So, I'm going to go ahead and graph it. This time I'm going to use Desmos because I want to go ahead and use the power that it gives me. And I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller so that I can have them both up at the same time. So we've got this function 10, 10 times x plus 5 squared. So I'm going to type in desmos.com. And press the red start graphing button. And I'm going to go ahead and type it in just like it's written. So I'm going to type in y and then equals y equals and it was 10 x sorry we got parentheses don't we and parentheses x plus 5 close parentheses, and then squared. All right, let's take a look. Where is the minimum of that function? And Desmos actually tells us. It tells us it's right there. So it goes ahead and highlights the point for us. So all I did was I tapped on that point or hovered over that point, and it tells me it's at negative 5, 0. So the question we have to do, this is one where we actually have to type in our answer. It's either negative 5 or 0. So the question is, which one's the minimum? Is it the x value or the y value? And the answer is the y value. We use y value for minimum just like we would use your height instead of your width if I asked how tall you are. Um, if I asked how tall you are and you told me, well, my, my shoulders are this far apart, that wouldn't be very helpful. Or I'm standing in this location. I'm actually asking for your y value, not your x value. Next, we have, and I pulled up Desmos because I wanted to do this next one here. And when we did it, I saw a lot of people come up and use Desmos and type this in. We have to do this four times uh, because we have to type in all four of these. But I'm actually going to jump ahead a little bit. You can type in all of these in, and we find the minimum value at negative 2. How many of them are at negative 2? Well, I can tell you right now that it's definitely not this one. And it's definitely not this one. The correct answers are number 2 and 3. Now, we're getting better about this. This unit, we're going more into transformations. But I can tell it's at negative 2 because all I'm doing is I'm looking at the y value, or sorry, the essentially the vertical shift right there. If you look right there, we have two that say negative 2 and two that say positive 2. And so that's kind of a code. I can look right there, and I know those ones have minimum at negative 2. All right, let's head back in here. 
What are the zeros of this graph? It doesn't give me the function, so how am I supposed to do this? I know zeros. If I plug in these numbers, I should get zero. But what does that mean from the graph perspective? That means I just need to look at the x-intercepts. I got one there, one there, and one there. My correct answer then is negative 2, 0, and positive 1. Number 14, again, zeros. So if I look right there and right there, negative 2 and 0. Number 15, what are the apparent zeros? All I'm doing, no, no math needed, I'm just going to pick my x-intercepts. And so that's negative 4, negative 1, and 3. Actually, this one's even easier because there are three of them, so I didn't even have to look at the numbers. That's the only one with three different intercepts. Number 16, which one of these has a y-intercept of 0, 3? Okay, so we could graph all of these, but we actually don't have to do that. We can tell just by looking at it, but instead of just using my expert math skills, let's just do the easy way. Or I should say the requires no extra skill way. Let's just plug in 0 for x and see which one gives us 3. So, first up, if I plug in 0 into this one, I get 3 over 0 minus 1 is negative 1. So is that going to fit there? Nope. Next one. If I plug in 0 for the second one, I get 3 over 0 plus 1 equals 3 over 1. So if I plug in 0, I get 3. Done. What are the y-intercepts of this function? And so this one is an absolute value function, which we're talking a lot about. Um, but I also want to draw your attention to what y-intercepts mean. We just had a problem with y-intercepts, and it had a y-intercept of 0, 3. In other words, it had a y-value, but the x-value was 0. So if it's a y-intercept, then it should be like 0, comma, blank. Which means... It's definitely not this one. It's also definitely not this one. Now from here again, we could just graph this into Desmos, but I wanted to use a little bit more logic as we do this. So what we can do to test it, all we really have to do is to plug in 0, negative 1. If we plug in 0, negative 1, if it works, if we plug in 0 and we get negative 1, then that must be the y-intercept because that's that would be a y-intercept if it's part of the function. So if I plug in 0, I get 0 plus 1. Absolute value makes it positive 1. Minus 2 makes it negative 1. Then it actually works. So my answer is A. Uh, truth be told, we didn't even have to plug that in because C has two answers. And if a function had two y-intercepts, then it wouldn't be a function because it would fail the vertical line test. So technically, we didn't even have to check A either. We could have just we could have just known it's not B, it's not C, and it's not D. The only one it can be is A. But we went ahead and plugged it in anyway, and it worked out. Again, this is just the logic of it. If you had a graphing calculator, which you do, you can go ahead and plug it in uh, and graph it and see where it is. What are the x-intercepts of this graph? Well, x-intercepts are on the x-axis. There, 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 and there. So there's actually four of them. So I'm going to cross out the one that has three right there. I'm going to cross out the one that has three right there. I've already narrowed it down to two, and I haven't even looked at the problem. I will say that those are really small, but I see that one of them is 0, 0. So guess what? It's C. That's the only one of those two that has 0, 0. And if you look, each of those points line up. Negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Number 19. This one is literally just asking us to plug in negative 2 for x. The catch is a lot of us got this wrong because we still are not using parentheses when we plug in a negative. And why that's so important is because if we go ahead and square this, 
negative 2 squared should end up being positive 4. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in. All right, on the bottom, negative 2 squared becomes 4. 4 times 4 is 16 minus 8. So 16 minus 8 is 8 on the bottom. On the top, negative 2 squared becomes 4. 4 times 4 is 16. Then we have plus a negative 2, which makes it minus 2, right? Plus a negative is the same as subtraction. And then minus 8. If we combine those like terms, we do 16 minus 2 is 14. And then 14 minus 8 is... That's right, 6. Now, if you were to type this in, 6 over 8, you would get it wrong, probably. I don't know if I was being particularly mean on the day that I assigned this test. But 6 over 8 is a fraction that can be simplified. So really, this should come out as 3 fourths or 0.75 or 0 0.75. I would definitely have counted all three of these right. If I was feeling really nice on the day that I wrote this question, I would have included that too. But technically, you got to simplify that. Okay? So whenever you get a fraction as an answer, make sure you simplify it. If it's a terminating decimal like 0.75, just type it in as a decimal. Okay? Number 20. Number 20 says, one, just look at the function. Look at that graph. And it says, what is the value of f of 4? f of 4... If we remember, when we have a function like f of x equals, let's say, x squared plus 2, whatever it is, right? Blah, 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 blah. The f of x means y. So what we're asking is when is y, or what is the y when the x is 4? So I look at the x on my x-axis, and I just go up to wherever it hits the line. So this is 4, 5. And 4, 5 means my answer is 5. I gave you a very similar question next, and it says, what is the x? In fact, it says x equals blank when the y is 4. So this time we'd look for the y to be 4, and we go over, and you can see that we hit right there. And so when y is 4, the x is 3. Number 22, the parent function, the parent graph of a function is this. So this is the graph of not the function, but the parent function. So what type of graphs make this picture? Now, if you don't know your parent functions, that's fine. You can literally plug each one of these in and see which one looks kind of like this. The truth is that only one of these will look remotely like this shape. This is a very special shape. And so if you type in each one, each one is going to look like something completely different. It's not that one. It's not that one. It's not that one. Correct answer is B. It looks like that shape. It's just like off center and it's a little shifted. Okay. So it's a little moved a little bit. But it's the same general shape. You've got these two big looping things that don't cross each other. Number 23, which statement is true about the end behavior of x cubed? We've looked at a couple x cubes. Uh, these cubic functions look kind of like an s, and but they look more or less like this. The end behavior, they have arrows on the end. They go off in two different directions. If you didn't know that, that's okay. You can just plug that into a graphing calculator and take a look. Now, if we look through our answer choices, it says as x approaches negative infinity, so as x goes this way, does y approach negative infinity? Uh, yeah, that's the answer. So I'm done. I could read the other ones, but that's the right one. The other ones don't work because they say the wrong thing. Like if x approaches positive infinity, does it go down? It does not. So the only one that it can be is a. Number 24, which of the following describes an end behavior for this function as x approaches positive infinity? If you're not familiar with this function, essentially what we have is something that blows up like that. Okay, It's kind of flat on the left-hand side, 
but on the right hand side it really blows up really fast okay uh, just takes off towards positive infinity okay if we were to look at it and say not as x approaches positive infinity but if they were to ask us about as x approaching negative infinity well this way it's not going to negative infinity it's not going to positive infinity it's actually going to zero it's getting closer and closer to zero okay um but that's okay if you didn't uh know this right here and what that looked like literally just plug it in and take a look number 25 again we're talking about in behavior again we're talking about as x approaches positive infinity and this is another graph that looks very similar to the last one except that since this is a fraction as x gets bigger the graph actually gets smaller okay so to give you an example of this if i couldn't really tell i'm like i don't know where it's going to and you wanted to just like test a few numbers if you were to plug in a number for x let's pick a big number for x but not insanely big what about 10. If I pick 10, you might think that's not very big, but give me a second. If I pick 10, then it's 1 half to the 10th power. What do you think that's close to? Is that going to positive infinity, negative infinity, 1 or 0? Okay, and so what we essentially have is that is going to a very small decimal. And so hopefully, as you could say, oh, well, I still can't tell what that is. We'll plug in 100, one half to the hundredth power and see what happens. And you're going to get an even smaller decimal. So what's happening? And again, if we look at the graph, it might be obvious to us. What's happening is we have a graph that's going and flattening out and going towards zero. All right, our last five questions, I think, are all complex numbers. So we've got our powers of i, i to the 12th. Remember when we have powers of i, i to the 12 means we need to take this and divide it by 4. What's 12 divided by 4? It's 3. What's our remainder? Our remainder is 0. Now, I actually don't care that it's 3. I only care about a remainder. Our remainder tells us that i to the 12th is equivalent to i to the 0 power. Anything to the 0 power is 1. Number 27, which is equivalent to this expression. So we have two complex numbers. We have a real part and imaginary part, and they are subtracted. Unfortunately, this is missed more often than I'd like because what we're doing is we're subtracting each part. So 6 minus 4 becomes the real part, and 8i minus 5i becomes the imaginary part. So that gives us 2 plus 3i. Now, some people fail to do this appropriately because they don't distribute that negative. They do the minus 4, but they don't do the minus 5i. So our answer is b. Number 28, the square root of negative 16 is not real. The square root of 16 is, the square root of 16 is 4. But the square root of negative 16 is going to be the same as square root of 16 and square root of negative 1. The square root of negative 1 is i. So our answer is 4i. It's not negative 4i because the negative is gone. We have turned the negative one into an i. Number 29, which is equivalent to 7i? Now, 7i is imaginary. There's no real part to it. So, which one of our answer choices would be equivalent? Well, in complex form, a plus bi form, the real part being zero would be a. b almost looks right until we realize that that's just seven with no imaginary part. c falls apart because 7i times 0 is 0, and d is just somebody being clever. Last one. Which one of these is true? On our first day of notes this year and every day since then, we had 
kind of reference this. We did this for like two weeks straight. We talked about negative one squared of negative one is i. In fact, we just wrote it on the last problem. So that's just a quick fact. All right, guys.